Well, welcome today to Christian Center. I don't know. Can, can, can we hear me? Yes. Hello, hello, hello. There we go. Welcome again to Christian Center this morning. If you turn and greet one another, uh, not in the name of the Lord, but with your name so they know who you are.
whose name is justice, and oh, he comes holding keys, for he has traded death for victory. <laughs> His eyes are a blazing fire His name is faithful and true And on His robe it is a rich and king of kings Hey, and hallelujah are a blazing fire His name is faithful and true And on His robe It is a written King of kings Oh yeah And because it's good news. It's 
good news. To the place he was dining to pour my life on my love, and I wrapped my hair around him, and the fragrance drifted up. But I didn't even notice when the beast began to turn. Cause his love is out of this world And I'm totally undone He's a lie, he's a lie And I've only just begun to worship him He's a lie And I've only just begun to worship him He's alive, and I've only just begun to worship Him. He's alive, and I've only just begun to worship Him. I went to the place where they laid Him to look upon His face. In garments blazing, we're standing in his place. Oh, I asked them, Where's my lover? Have you heard in him from me? Because I've so much more to give to the one who set me free. They said he's alive. He's alive, and you've only just begun to worship Him. He's alive, and you've only just begun to worship Him. He's alive, and you've only just begun to worship Him. He's alive. And you've only just begun to worship Him. Now I go to the places He lingers, and I follow Him in my song. I feel His breath on my fingers as I lift Him up. I know this is just the beginning of this wonderful way. I'm riding on a ribbon of never ending praise. You're alive, you're alive, and we've only just begun to worship you. You're alive, and we have only just begun to worship you. You're alive, and we have only just begun to worship you. You're alive, and we have only just begun to worship you. We've got so 
much more for you, won't you break us open? We want to pour it all on you. Break us open, break us open, break us open, and pour us out, God. Break us open, break us open. Break us open and pour us out. Break us open. Break us open. Break us open. Pour us out. Break us open. Break us open. Break us open. Pour us out. Like a sweet smelling fragrance Let my life be like an alabaster jar An alabaster jar That you break wide open Break wide open May the praises come out like a river A river, a river It's never ending praise Never ending praise To earth, yes, yeah, never ending praise, never ending praise, never ending praise from earth to heaven, never ending praise, it's never ending praise, never ending praise. Oh, hey, it's your life, sing your life, your life. You're alive, and we've only just begun to worship you. You're alive, and we've only just begun to worship you. You're alive, and we've only just begun to worship you. You're alive. We've only just begun May my life be like a song May my life be like a song We've only just begun It's only the beginning Only the beginning There's an eternity coming Eternity coming, yeah. We've only just begun, only just begun to worship, to worship. I just, uh, in the spirit, I just saw like this open window, and I just saw like a megaphone um, in, in in this window, and I just felt like the Lord said that there are windows of opportunity that He wants to to uh, amplify to us this morning. And I I just get this sense in my spirit that uh, the Lord wants to just end all distractions right now. And that as you focus on the Lord, that opportunities are going to begin to just come into your mind where I have an opportunity for this, I have an opportunity for that. And uh, you're going to begin to distance yourselves from things that you thought were solid in the past. And I just, I just felt this, that there was, a, there was just this opening of that. So, Father, I just thank you right now, Lord, for these, uh, Lord, these windows of opportunity, Lord, that's here this morning, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would just begin to open up this new thing, Lord, to push us away, Lord, from the familiar things, Lord, even the ways that we've known your presence, Lord, that are familiar to us, Lord. We open ourselves up to a new expression of you today, Lord. We open up 
uh, our, our spirit to say, Lord, we receive everything that you have for us, Lord, right now. Lord, I just ask, Lord, that business ideas would manifest, Lord, today. Lord, opportunities would begin to come, Lord, Father. In Jesus' name, you would just have a... Um, I just felt like the Lord said that some of you, He wants to just season you this morning. He wants to just... Uh, I just The picture I saw is like a turkey, and He's putting a, a, a baster on you and just filling you full of stuff that's really seasoning. So... Uh, quit being a turkey and just get filled with his spice uh, this morning. I just kept hearing, even before Lindy sang the song, I kept hearing that um, a lot of us came here today and um, we have that concept and the idea that, that Jesus died and, and he did and he died. But I just keep hearing that he's alive and that we need to just, we need to, not that we need to forget that he died, but we need to walk in the fact that he's alive. And this is a new thing in this place. I kept seeing us coming in and, and picturing today like a box. Like we kept picturing, this is what it's going to be like today. This is how it's going to be. But I saw the Lord just like swing open the lid of the box. And I saw a new river coming out of it. So I just want everybody to just just open their heart today. Lord, we just ask you open our hearts, Lord. God, that we will receive, Lord, what you have for us, God. That we won't put you in a box, Lord. God, that we will flow in the river that you open up for us today, God. God, we'll expect new things, God, to come. We'll expect new things to happen, God. And we just thank you, Lord, for your word. And we know that you're alive, Lord, alive and well, Lord. And we thank you for that. We were at a conference this weekend, and I bought a, I bought a painting while we were there. And uh, the Lord was, I just kept seeing this picture of this painting. And it was a picture of a lion, and he's roaring. And I... I kept seeing that picture this morning. I felt like the Lord said he's roaring. He's roaring over us this morning. And I, I felt like the roar was to wash away and to tell the things that speak to the mind, to clear it and reset and just bring clearness in the mind so he could speak. And I really, I felt like the, last night at this conference we were at, there was a shift when people would just begin to really just press in. And... <laughs> And we began to dance. And I really felt like some of you just, some things are just binding you up. And you just need to dance before the Lord. And break, so the Lord can just bring freedom to you. So I just declare freedom right now. And that the lion would roar. And it would bring freedom to your mind. Freedom to your spirit, man. And things that are just tying you up, and holding you back, would be broken off right now in Jesus' name. So Lord, we just thank you for that, Lord. We just ask, Lord, you say where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So we just ask that you bring a spirit of freedom in this place, Lord, with your presence, Father. Lord, that you would wash us with your presence today, Lord. God, that there'd be a shift in everyone here, Lord. Like Leslie said, they came, God, they just said, some came with one thing on their heart, but Lord, they leave with another, Lord. God, that they leave with a shift for you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for that, Lord. When Leslie said a new box being opened up and a river coming out of it, the Lord showed me a vision, and I saw us in this church worshiping, and there was a glow of glory on each one of us. And then, oh man, and then we kind of, it's like he pulled a string, and he tied us together and concentrated us, and then the Lord opened the top of the bag just slightly, and a beam of glory shot out of the bag and shot up through the atmosphere, and God's glory collided with our glory and it then went around the earth and it began to encompass the earth with this fiery glow of glory. So Lord, right now we release the glory on us. We don't come just to receive, but we come to meet you, God, and to have the glory that you placed on our lives collide with your fullness of glory. And we say, come God, let the glory, the knowledge of the glory of God be known in this earth as water covers the sea. In Jesus' name. Let's just worship him now. We just worship you, Lord. Oh, we worship you, God. You're alive, and we've only just begun to worship you. We've only started, Lord. You're alive. I'm, you're alive, Lord. And we've only just begun your life. Yes, Lord. You're to worship you you're alive and we have only just begun to worship you you're alive and we have only 
I just heard the passage when Jacob had built an altar uh, where the ladder ascended and descended, where the angels would go up and down. And it was a demonic controlled area. It was an enemy ruled the land. And he built an altar and Jacob said, this is nothing, none other than the house of God. And I want you to know, no matter what darkness is going on around you, look at our nation, whatever it doesn't matter. We can build a place in the Lord that we can say, this is none other than the house of God. This is a place where he dwells. This is a place where he speaks and functions and flows through. And I kept hearing uh, uh, Psalm 83 this morning, and I just want to decree this over us in our intercession. It said, David prayed, and he said, oh God, do not be, remain quiet. Do not be silent. Oh, God, do not be still. And it was a cry of his heart because the enemy was trying to destroy all of Israel. And I want you to know, you know it as well as I do, that the enemy wants to destroy you and the church of Jesus Christ. But we are to cry out to God that he would not remain quiet concerning that, that he would not be silent and he would not be still concerning the plans of the enemy against his people. And so we just decree that. We pray that right now, Lord, that you would no longer be silent. That, Lord, that you would no longer be still, but that you would rise up just like you did in Midian. That that many times that you overcame the enemy, Lord, you sent the enemy into disarray. We just ask that, Lord, your move of your hand would start today. Lord, in this nation, Lord, the, 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 the enemy that's trying to destroy the body of Christ, Lord, that it would be thrown into disarray. And we ask that your hand would move on behalf of your kids upon your children, Lord. In this hour, Lord, we cry out for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord spoke to me clearly, and he said, many of you came here for many different reasons today. Some just because it was the day of the Lord for you. Some just for whatever you need, you have a need, whatever. The Lord said, you came here for one reason, but you'll leave with another. And I felt like the Lord said, I'm going to transform you and, and, and just move your mind into a new place. And I heard this. The Lord said, I'm about to tweak some of you. I'm about to squeeze you a little bit and move you a direction that you need to go so that you can fulfill your prophetic mandate in this hour. You are going to receive a clear word from the Lord by His Spirit today, and the Lord's going to begin to adjust your walk. And I felt like some of you are stuck in a place like you're on a treadmill, and I saw that in the Spirit. And the Lord said, I'm about to get you off the treadmill, 
and you're going to begin to flow and run after me with all your heart. And as you do, I kept hearing this, that the endurance of the times past, in other words, what you've gone through in the spirit of endurance, the Lord said, I'm going to give you the strength to run long distances in the future. And you will not grow weary and you will not grow tired in this coming season. The Lord's about to break off weariness off of many minds, so much so you will feel like there's not enough time in the day to complete your mandate. And you'll wake up with energy the next day because you didn't get to finish the day before. And there's going to be a whole activation of an energy that only comes from the Lord. For His eyes will be upon you and your eyes will be upon Him. So I felt like there's a real shift of the spirit of vision. And God's about to change many of your visions. You've been going after one thing, but after today you're going to go after another because the Lord's going to tweak your vision. You're going to see where it's been selfish. You're going to see where it's been self-absorbing. And you're going to get a mindset that it's for the kingdom and for the king. And so this morning, the Lord said, I'm about to anoint with scrolls of mandates this morning, a royalty with royal designations and decrees as you leave this place. So I call this day a congressional meeting. I declare that there will be commissionings this morning upon many of us as we go forward. So, Lord, I just ask for the activation of this word, these prophetic words that have come forth, the prayers that have been cried out. We just ask for a full activation in this hour. We say this is the day you made, and we're going to rejoice, and we're going to be glad in this day because we knew we were born for a day such as this. And we honor you today. We honor what you're doing in the earth and your purposes for this day. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. It says, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. So we just shout before the Lord. We fulfill the scripture. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All right. All right. Hug two or three people and tell them you're about to be tweaked. You're about to be tweaked. Tell them. God's about to shift them. All right. All right. God's brought some instruments today here to tighten us up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad you're here this morning. <clears throat> Quickly, open your Bible to Romans 11. We want to take up the offering. And I, uh, we, we're preparing in a month from now to take up our first fruit offering. And uh, do we have those CDs? Are they back there anywhere? They're in the office. In the bookstore. Okay. Good. Uh, Brother Robert Henderson released a word on first fruits, and some of you weren't able to be here. So when I say first fruits, you may have a different meaning. I encourage you. We're giving away the free CD from that service. So they're in the book, uh, the book room, um, bookstore back here. So you can just pick one up on your way out today. But in Romans 11, we're going to talk about the first fruit for just a second. We're going to take up our offering. Um, the tithe and the first fruit are a little bit different. Uh, first fruit offering is a, a, an offering that the Israelites, the Jews, would do once a year. And it would be a, an offering they'd give as a, at one time as the Lord would just give them a, a large portion that they would sow into the kingdom. And then God would bless their entire harvest the entire year long. Uh, this is the first fruits feast that comes right after Passover. And Jesus was our first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. So when Jesus was a picture of what is available to everybody, when Jesus was ascended to the Lord, it made it possible for you and I to be ascended because he was the first fruits. Even though Lazarus was raised from the dead, he didn't ascend, okay? He just rose from the dead. Even though Enoch uh, was taken to be with the Lord Elijah was, they never died. So Jesus was the picture of a, somebody who dies uh, in this flesh, but then has an opportunity to be resurrected in the end. So he had to be the first. And because he's the first, we can do that. So he represents the whole. So Jesus is our picture of what he, when he had and what he went through, we can go through as well. And so that's why we look at him as the first fruits of the resurrection. And in the picture here, it says in verse 16 of uh, Romans 11, and this is the whole story about Israel and the Jewish people and the Gentiles working together. But uh, it says here in verse 15, it says, For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And we realize that's talking about Israel 
uh, the day that they're going to be re- uh, saved and, and really regrafted back into what they were called to. But it says this, if the first fruit, or your translation may say first piece, of dough is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. That's why we give and tithe and, not, and first fruits because we're sowing it in the holiness to the Lord, and then it makes everything else we have holy. And so even though you spend 90% or more of your money on, on yourself, it's holy money. You know, it's because the Lord, when you sow in your tithe, you're sowing and it makes it holy, and so therefore it can be used for God's purposes. And then he'll multiply it all along the way. How many of y'all want some multiplication? The best thing about the kingdom, it's about addition and multiplication. The, the kingdom of darkness is about subtraction and, and division. So we want to look at math and things. So we serve a king that's in the multiplication and addition. Hallelujah. So take your offering. Let's, let's sow into that kingdom. We're not going to sow into the other one. Now, so as I sow today, this is my first fruit as far as my tithe. But as I sow it, it makes all my income holy. And so it makes yours as well. I think if we see our income as holy, uh, then we'll honor what we do with it. We'll honor how we function with it because we see that he's the one that gave it to us and we sow it back to him. This is part of the Abrahamic covenant that we're sowing into. And so, Lord, we just take our offerings today, our tithes, whatever the Lord you've told us to give today. And we thank you, Lord, as we sow this, it makes it all holy because you're the first fruit, Lord, of everything that we do. And our income, well, we want to make sure that we sow to you first before we sow to anything else. We want to say, Lord, thank you for the provision of our homes and our jobs and our, our businesses, everything that you've provided for us. And we ask for exponential growth in the days ahead, Lord, even in this economy that's going nuts. I just pray that, Lord, uh, Lord, your kids will be prospering in this hour. And it will be a sign and a wonder to this world that, God, you bless your children because they're faithful in your covenants. And so, Lord, as we're faithful in this covenant today, those that are sowing, I pray that, Lord, just faith would arise in them. I, I break every mindset or every lie that has come to anybody here today, Lord, that says this is not a good thing or that they can't do this. I just break that, Lord. You broke it in many of us. Break it in them. And so we sow with faith today, and we say, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to sow of the first piece of our income and the first that you give us today. And bless it accordingly in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I don't, we don't have announcements, do we, right? So read your bulletin. There you go. <laughs> Pastor Jimmy's had a, uh, we were, oh, we have a baby shower. We must announce that. We have a baby shower this evening, actually, for Jack and Stacy Dysart. Would y'all please stand up so everybody can see who you are? <laughs> We'd love for everybody to come out and help us celebrate the a soon arrival of baby Hannah, their firstborn daughter, and uh, love to see you here. We're going to have a, uh, <clears throat> it's going to be the second Saturday in March, looks like March 9th on my calendar, my wife's calendar here. Um, we're going to, we did a fundraiser, you may have seen like my kids and Isaac Paul selling cookie dough and all that kind of stuff through last year. We raised some money to uh, redo the playground outside, and what we're going to do is, is we, we have mulch that's going to be coming in like that Friday, and we need some men, women, whoever, to come and to help out doing, we're going to do a work day. What we're going to do is meet up here at the school or the church at 8 o'clock Saturday, that Saturday morning, and uh, bring wheelbarrows, uh, rakes, anything that you have you can help with, and we're going to spread the mulch, and we also have to... Uh, I can give more details later, but we're going to have to build the boxes around the playground stuff to, to put the mulch in. So we're going to need some help. Thanks. Amen. Okay. And we do our start a school of ministry. We're going to cut off our uh, registration tomorrow night. So uh, if you haven't joined by tomorrow night, you are expelled. You can't come back, all right? So this will be the last night, and you'll be a little bit behind, but we, we pray a spirit of acceleration on you and that you can catch up with the last two services. We have a basic prophetic class. We have a second-level prophetic class, and then we have a redemptive gift class. So uh, if you haven't uh, been to any of those classes, we, we invite you to join. They start at 6.30 tomorrow night. All right, you all ready? Lord, we just ask for your uh, word to go forth today in power and might. We ask that, Lord, our hearts be open to receive your word today. 
Lord, you have a shift for us, and we want to be a part of this shift. We will honor what you're doing in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. There's my friends from Lafayette. I heard we have a group of Lafayette. How many Lafayette people we have? Okay. Well, let's welcome them this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. We love our children. We love them so much. We're going to let them go. All right. Verse, uh, I mean, ages 6 to 12. That's not verses. That's ages. All right. What do y'all call people from Lafayette? Are y'all Cajun? <laughs> That's good. I, you know, I, I didn't know if y'all had a, a Lafayetteans or something. I didn't know what y'all call yourself. We love Lafayette. Uh, we ministered down there before, and we are Todd Trahan and you guys. I know this is my friend. I've known you forever. Gosh, I'm glad you're here today. All right. <clears throat> well, today is a special day. Every day is special, but today is a really special day uh, because today is a, is a holiday in the spirit realm as well as on the Jewish calendar. And today is, is Purim, or Purim, uh, or if you're from southern Israel, Purim. You know, it just depends on where you're from. But uh, the Hebrew way of saying is Purim, and uh, it's the story of Esther. So I want you to open the book of Esther, if you would. And uh, Esther in your Bible is just one book before Job or Job, depending on where you're from. And uh, all right, so you can just find that, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. I like when kids learn the books of the Bible and they... It always helps them remember where they are. <clears throat> it's one of my favorite stories because, of, not just because the story is so good, but because of the victory that was won. And I believe that we are going to see another day of Purim. And we're going to see battles. We're going to see, we know that at the end of the age, there's going to be a great battle in Jerusalem. Uh, Zechariah tells us that uh, two out of three people will die. So we know there's some prophetic that's unfulfilled uh, um, as far as the end of the age. And so uh, Israel is not through going through some of its what you'd call a holocaust and hardship. And so uh, we are going to lay this out uh, for that reason. And we are in a season of commissioning and everybody taking their rightful place governmentally. Okay? So I want you to understand that. And I want to do something real quick because... um, I want to raise up Esther's here this morning. All right. Now, you guys, you'll look good in a dress. Just chill out, all right? You, we're all called to be the bride of Christ. And I'm going to ask my elders to come, and uh, Brother Gary Miller and his wife, Terry, and Walter and Sissy, and uh, if they'll come forward here. And I want to do this um, because the Lord told me today was a day of commissioning. So I want to start with these guys and then I want to commission you guys at the end. All right, is that okay? Because God, some of y'all, we got so many new people here uh, that y'all don't even know these people. And I love these people because they're my elders. And uh, not that they're older than me, but they, but they are. All right. <laughs> they say an elder is anybody who's 10 years older than you. <clears throat> not, she's not 10, so they're not that. And so uh, these guys have been walking with us for a long time, and, and uh, we've gone through a lot of shift in leadership through the years. And this is Gary and Terry Miller, for those that you don't know, and this is Sissy and Walter Johnson, and they've just been faithful and with us. And, and Rob and, and Deidre are with us too as well, and they've been elders here for a long time. And, uh, but we want to commission them today, uh, recommission them is a better way of looking at it, because... We're in a season where we're moving out of the, out of the, out of the uh, congregational mindset and into an apostolic mindset. So these roles of these guys are going to be different. The word elder doesn't just, it does mean old. <laughs> Hallelujah. I like your gray hair, brother. There we go. Uh, but it also means somebody who is in the council of the celestial. And so these guys' responsibility and their wives' responsibility is to go to the heavens and get counsel from heaven and to be counsel for us and for counsel for you. So I am in telling you that you don't have to drag me down and find me to get counsel. Hallelujah. <laughs> but these guys carry counsel, and they are wise. It's not just because they're, they're, they're uh, uh, old. They're not old because I'm not far behind them. But they have been tested in life. All of them have. And they have been proven to stand with the Lord in the midst of every crisis. Okay? 
These guys' lives are not perfect. That's one thing I require on my staff and leadership that you cannot be perfect. So that makes everybody here qualified, all right? So none of us are perfect, but they have a place where they trust the Lord with all their heart, and they lean not to their own understanding, but they lead to the, lean to the Lord's. And so I want to commission them as a spirit, as a picture here today of like Esther being touched and being anointed to be a queen, to be somebody who rules governmentally in that, because our whole house is in a shift here. And if you're with us, you're in the shift with us, so get ready. You know, you're going to come. I'm going to ask John to come, if you will, and Brother Rob, if you'll come up here. I want you to help me lay hands on, on, on these guys and just release a, a commissioning. Now, at the end, we're going to do it for all you. Do you want it? You're going to get it. You showed up for one reason today, but you're going to get touched in another. Lafayette's going to be shifted, not because you came here today, but because you came here on this day, all right? The Lord ordained that. And so, what's that? Okay. So, uh, and so this is something in the Spirit. When we do this in the Spirit, it shifts everything. Uh, I remember when I was doing deliverance on a demon-possessed girl once, and I, I, I had a whole team of people praying with me on this girl, and we... I was the only one that could cast the demons out, and I was really frustrated because I said, Lord, I said, these people know Jesus just like I do. Why can't they get them out? You know, and the Lord uh, really just began to work with me, and I called a deliverance minister, and I said, what's the deal? And, and it said that to me, the demons recognized you as an authority, and you had not commissioned them, and so they didn't recognize them in your presence. And I thought, well, I never understood that realm and so forth, so I silly me. I said, well, okay, I'll trust this lady. I don't even know if she'd tell me the truth. But anyway, and so we did the next session. I commissioned them in front of the girl that was demon-possessed, and immediately they started casting out demons. And I thought, wow, because, see, the enemy understands protocol and alignment. The only people that don't really are the church. And I'm not talking about submitting to people and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about alignment. And so when God anoints somebody, the anointing of that oil, it's like it goes down Aaron's beard. It just flows all the way down. And so I want to give them some. I've got a little beard. I'm going to give them some of my oil here, all right? Now, I sit under guys like Chuck Pierce and Paul Keith Davis and other guys, and theirs flows on me. So, and then they're over some people over them, and it flows on them, and it goes all the way back to our great high priest Jesus, whom it flows from, and it flows on all of us. All right, y'all with me? All right, so we'll just pray for these guys. Lord, I just thank you for Gary and Terry and what they carry in the Spirit. And, Lord, today in front of all the people, I I commission them as co-laborers in the ministry here as we make this apostolic shift. And I say now that they're elders under an apostolic house and that, Lord, in the Spirit, these guys carry a weight that we have never seen them carry before. And, Gary, upon you will be a new weight to see the celestial to go into the heavenlies and begin to pull down the mysteries of the kingdom. And in this place, the Lord says, you will begin to see and you'll be a watchman on the wall and you will see the enemy from afar. And you will be able to pour upon people and release upon people wisdom that's beyond your years and beyond your mind. And the Lord said that you will see the enemy for people's lives and for their businesses and for their homes. And you will release words for them of comfort and words of understanding and words of to, be, to live by. And I just really feel like God's going to anoint your tongue for that. And so, Lord, I commission him today. And as us leaders behind him here, we put our hands on him and we commission him. We commission Terry with the same anointing because the two are one. Now, this woman has a gift of administration. And the Lord says he's going to use her to administrate the kingdom and the tools of the kingdom and the wealth of the kingdom within her hand. And I saw this upon you, Terry, that you're going to release his wisdom upon the people's hearts. And many of you young ladies can come and sit at her feet, and she'll teach you the ways of administration of the kingdom. And she can give you wisdom, and she can tell you in five minutes what it may take you five years to learn. And the Lord said it will flow from her tongue, and it will flow out of her. And so we commission her. We make this team a co-labors in this ministry and for this purpose. And we set them apart as elders in this place, Father, for the apostolic shift that we're in. Lord, I thank you, and I seal this in the Spirit. I seal what you're doing. And, Lord, even for Walter and Sissy, we recommission them. They've already been elders. They've been functioning this. We commission them too, Lord. You come, Gary. Yeah. And we just say that, Father, that they're co laborers with us here, and we commission them now into the apostolic shift, that they will be elders in an apostolic house, 
who will help others get to where they need to be. And I felt like that, Walter. The Lord said you, he's going to give you this, like this catapult anointing, to catapult people to another realm. You're going to give them words of wisdom. You're going to look at them in the spirit and say, look, this is your issue or this is what needs to happen. And as you do, you're going to speak five words that will make five years of difference. And so I felt like that's a whole anointing upon you. And, and I know you're a lawyer, but there's a whole thing about the law of the kingdom of God is in you. And the Lord said you'll carry his law of his kingdom. And as you walk in, it'll be a testimony. And the Lord's going to erase years of discouragement. And he's going to erase years of, of what it seems like failure uh, of some things that you've been desiring to see. And so I felt like this is your season as you move in this shift. And for Sissy, this is a visionary. This woman sees like mm, nobody's business. But it's a whole thing that the people don't understand what she sees. And the Lord said he's going to give you words to go with what you see. He's going to give you spiritual words. And you will see where we're going. You're going to see what's going to happen. And so I commission this team right here as one, as elders in this house. And so I just feel like this is your season. Esters are here. And, Lord, I just commission this whole team here. And, Lord, I also want to pray for Rob. I know Dieter's not here, but we just pray for him and and pray for Rob. And he's in this transition season for his life. And, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you commissioned him long ago and you set him apart long ago. And, then, Father, this is his season, Lord, to step up. This is his season to begin to walk in his mandate and his call. And we commission him, Father, according to your purposes, Lord. We pray for a shift in his heart, a shift in his mind to see, Lord, that what you want to see for him. Lord, I just pray that, that I just felt like, Rob, that Lord's going to bend your mind and your heart to see things differently. And you're going to see him in another way you've never seen him before. You've been walking this walk a long time. And the Lord said you're going to walk in a greater capacity in the days ahead. So, Father, we release that mandate to him as well. We honor him today. We honor what he carries and what the fruit that's in this house from what he walked in. Lord, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Rob was my youth pastor for a while, and so I have a lot of fruit. John was one of his disciples, and so any problems you have with John, please go to Brother Rob, all right, if you would. (laughs) All right, so that's a prophetic picture. Lord, want me to do that first before we get into Esther as far as what we go with here. here. And, and y'all, really, look at them now in a different way. Look at them as leadership in a different way. And they're really good, great counsel for me, and uh, they just walk with me. And we don't have governmental problems in this house. I'm sorry if that disappoints some of you. But we don't have that because, see, we are all walking as one vision for the Lord. And I just love that. I've been in bad government. I have. I've been a part of it. I've been part of the bad government, you know, whatever. And the Lord has just shifted us that way. Now, today is Purim, like I said, and it's a story of Esther. Y'all know the story of Esther very well. I'd encourage you to go read it again today after the service or tonight or sometime this week uh, because it's a great festival. And if you know the story, you know, the king wanted to replace Vashti and her queen and, and just begin to look. And so all these people were pulled into, all these women were pulled in. And uh, uh, Israel was in captivity at that time. And Esther uh, was being taken care of by her uncle, Uncle Mordecai, who, because she didn't have a mother or father. And he is a type of the Holy Spirit. And he is overseeing you because he watched over her. And so the Holy Spirit is overseeing you today because within this room are Esthers that have not been activated. You have the call within you. All you need is some beauty treatments. Some of you guys need some beauty treatments, all right? We're not talking about physical. We're talking about spiritual beauty treatments. The Lord has clearly shown me in the prophetic recently the only reason I cannot go higher in the prophetic is because I have not died enough to self. Because there is no limitation to what God wants to say to me prophetically or to do with me prophetically or you prophetically There's no limit to that because Moses went from a place that he could not see God to a place that he could be mouth-to-mouth with God. And it's because he says in Numbers chapter 12 that he kept all the commandments of the Lord. It wasn't, he wasn't legalistic. You got to understand that. We always think of Moses, the lawgiver, but Moses at the end of doing all 613 laws, he says to Israel, choose this day, life or death, blessing or curse. In other words, here's the laws you can choose. You can do whatever you want. You have freedom. You have free will to do what you want, but you can choose it. And so Moses was a man of choice. 
And he made a choice that I'm going to go for all that God has. And he said, Lord, I want to see your glory. And the Lord passed by him and showed his backside, and he showed his goodness before him. And when Moses saw his goodness, he saw the goodness of God in the land of living, and he saw that God would be more than willing to talk to him mouth to mouth. And when you see the goodness of God, you'll see that he doesn't want to keep any information away from you. He says that he doesn't do anything in the earth. According to Amos, he says he doesn't do anything in the earth unless he reveals the secrets of his plans to his prophets, his servants. So God doesn't like to keep secrets about what he's about to do. He likes to let us have inside information and so that we'll be ahead of the game, ahead of the game investment-wise so that we'll know what to invest in so when the harvest comes, we're right in the middle of it. Y'all, I preach better than you just responded, all right? That's a good word right there. Because, see, you can have an investment of what to sow your life into ahead of time, and you're ahead of the game if you listen to his voice. All right? That's what can happen here. I'm not trying to provoke amens, but if I did, hallelujah. All right? So we see that she comes in to the, the verse, I mean, chapter 2 there. If you want to, we'll just go through some verses. I'm not going to read this whole story. But we see that who she is in verse 7 of chapter 2, and it says, uh, Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father and mother. Now, the young lady was beautiful of form and face, and when her father and her mother died, then Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So we see that she was beautiful in the natural ability, but I want you to know this. Even though you, weren't, you may not have been blessed with natural beauty, whatever, uh, and don't, get, don't think that you have been. In other words, we can find flaws in everybody. Ladies, some of you have hell damage. You know, guys, you have, you know, have, uh, you know, your chest has moved to your drawers. Things like that happen to us as we get older. But it's not, <laughs> y'all can laugh. Oh, all right, here we go. We don't want to get caught up in ourselves. We want to understand that it's the grace of God that we have anything good in us. And even though she was blessed with physical beauty, it was a picture of her spiritual beauty. That she had the form and likeness of God. She had the face of God. She just had not gone through the treatments in order to come to the king. And the only reason that you're not having an audience with the king sometimes is because you haven't done enough in yourself and as far as going to Christ and say, Lord, deal with my stuff so that I can come to your, to your presence in such a special way. And so we see that and go down to verse 11. It said, every day Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem because she got put in this harem to, to be prepared to possibly come before the king. And he came before the, whore of the, uh, the, the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. Now, the harem here speaks of the church. I, I hate to call the church a harem, but you know what I'm saying? It's just a place where all those potential brides come to. And so the church is a place where we all have a potential to be a bride. And he comes in, and he's like the Holy Spirit. He's going to and fro. He's hovering over, just like in day one creation, where the, Lord, the world was formless and dark without void, and the light came and began to hover over it. The light is his spirit. It's who he is. And so what happens as you're in the church, the Holy Spirit's hovering over you to see the darkness and the formlessness of your life, to see if he can bring light to those things so that you can come out of your darkness into the marvelous light. It says in day one creation that this light came and it separated the light from the darkness. So when the Holy Spirit comes into you, he separates it. I've had prophetic dreams where God is one day going to begin to divide the body of Christ between the bride and the church. I can do a whole teaching on that, about that, and blow some of your denominational doctrine. But it's a whole thing about that there's a the part of the body of Christ, and according to the book of Revelation, the ch- seven churches where Jesus said, the, to them that overcome... And there is an overcoming aspect to the body of Christ that is not part of the normal... In the book of Song of Songs, it talks about uh, this very thing that Solomon said of the, of the brides. He said, I have virgins without number. I have 80 concubines, 60 queens, but I only have one bride. And he begins to describe the breaking down of the body of Christ. There are virgins without number in the body of Christ. Virgins are those who have had no intimacy with the king. They got married, but they don't even have an understanding that and Solomon had wives that on paper were his wives, but he never even knew them. 
They got the privileges of the kingdom. They got a place to live. They got all the blessings of that. But the fact was they never got to be with the king. And Jesus said that many times when he said, you know, did we not cast out uh, demons in your name? Did we not heal the sick? And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. So there are those in the body that don't have an intimate relationship and they're virgins. Now they get the benefits of the kingdom because they got saved. You know, I asked Jesus in my heart, but then that's as far as they went. Then you have 80 concubines that he has. They get a little bit closer. Then you have 60 queens. They get a little bit closer, but he has one bride. And exponentially, if you look at that, out of 700 wives, he had one he called the bride. So you can lay a measure out there that maybe one out of 700 are willing to pay the price. That's just a thought. That's not theology. That You can put that in your theological oven and just cook it and see what happens, all right? But I want to get to this place where Esther was put in a group of people. She was part of the virgins without number, so she went ahead and submitted to the work of the Lord in her life. Okay, this is what she did in a, in a spirit realm here. And it says, now, when the turn of the day, each young lady came, verse 12, came to, uh, depending on what your translation, King Xerxes, uh, and at the end of the 12 months, under the regulations for the women, for the, six day, for the days of their beautification was completed as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and cosmetics. Hallelujah. So it's a 12-month process that she goes. 12 is government. God was preparing her to be in the government of the king. See, we're called to be governmental in the church. The ecclesia means governmental. That's why King James, when he did his translation, he did not want the word ecclesia in Scripture, so he told the writers to put church there because he didn't want any challenge to his secular government. And we are to be a challenge to our secular government in the sense that we are to be ruling from heavenly places. And if these people, then Romans 13 said, God appoints leaders for our good. Well, guess what? If they're not for our good, it's time for us to rule in the heavenlies and begin to remove those people from office. All right, our guns are in the back, and when we leave, we're going to go to war, all right? Because we're called to do that. We don't do it with physical anymore. We do it in the spirit. The, the Isaiah 22 says that there was a guy named uh, Shebna who was appointed by God but used his office for his own gain. So God said, he's got to go. And so he puts a man named Eliah come in there, and he throws Shebna out headlong. So that means that we have an authority as Ecclesia to begin to remove Shebnas from office. And so what has happened, we've done that in Louisiana. We have removed many Shebnas from office by the spirit of prayer. Isn't that true? We have done that. And now we have somewhat of a, a, a right, righteous type government in our state. I'm not saying they're all right. I'm just saying we're heading that direction. We have legislators in our state that vote right because they don't want to be caught on the left side. That's their own words. I don't want to vote for this, but I have to because if I don't, those people, let's talk about us, are going to mark us. We have a, a the Focus on the Family group, Family Forum, has a list called the Hall of Shame. And we put these people in the Hall of Shame when they vote against moral, godly issues. And these, these senators and these reps don't want to be on that list. So they vote properly. Hallelujah. Because we're being the ecclesia in Louisiana. We're functioning that, and that's what Esther was called to do. If you don't be careful, I'm going to start preaching here. All right, hang on. So she went through this process. All, which is the spirit of myrrh, is the cross. So she went six months of that. You understand what they would do? They would just massage. First of all, they, they had these things that they would scrape her skin. You know, those stupid things y'all ladies use in the bathtub? You know, they look like a, some animal or something. Anyway, you just scrub, and it gets all the dead skin off it. What do they call those things? Loofa. That sounds funny. A loofa. All right. <laughs> Ryan, do you have a loofa? No, you don't. He does. Okay, that's good. Anyway, you get, all, you get all this dead stuff off of you, and it's scrubbing, and so they were being worked over by teachers and equippers, people who fathered them and loved them. And begin to take their flesh off of them. Then, then, you know, God puts those sister sandpapers and brother sandpapers in your life. Just to get that to see if you'll respond in love to their anger. To respond in love when they make fun of you. 
And if you don't do well, you get to do it again the next day. Okay? And so when you, when you get rid of one of your Judases, God's faithful to send you another. And one thing I found about Judas is if you get rid of one and you didn't, and you didn't get finished the work, he sends one that's worse. So just be thankful for the Judas you have. Just thank you, Lord, for that one. You know, at least I know what this one does. And so they begin to massage the oil of the Spirit. This is about being baptized and washed in the oil of the Spirit. And you know why they did that? So that when Esther would sweat and get hot, the oil of myrrh would come out of her. That means about the trials and the hardships of your life. When you have so much of the Holy Spirit in you, when the trials and fire of life come, what comes out is the Holy Spirit. What comes out is the myrrh of what Jesus did on the cross for you, that he delivered you from this situation, even though the situation looks horrible. But you've got to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit. You got to let him massage you, push you hard. You ever seen a massage where they put their, you know, like their elbows on your knees? And then we got a massage therapist back there. She can demonstrate to you later, all right? For about 150 bucks, all right? You can do it. Is that a good price? Amen, all right. I need an offering, all right? Here we go. So we do this, and so she went through that, and she was successful at that. So when you succeed, Six months is the number of man. When you succeed in allowing the Holy Spirit to pour into you as a man everything that he has, you're ready to go to the next level of training. And so she went to the next level, and she got all these cosmetics. And for women, if we study Hebrew, we get a whole different meaning on that. But it's a whole thing about the beauty of the Lord being put upon us so that when people look at us, they don't see us, they see the Lord. How many of you ladies are willing to go into public without your makeup? Us guys do it every day. All the men said, amen, all right? So what you see is what you get. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I mean, Brother Rob always said, can I say it, Brother Rob? All old barns need a new coat of paint. That's what he said. I don't know what it means, but it's what he said. All right. <clears throat> they didn't like it, Rob. That's, so he's the one that said it. All right, here we go. And so this whole thing of allowing his nature to be put in us so that when people look at us, they see him. And see... It's a whole thing. Can you be naked and be unashamed? We teach people in dreams that if you have dreams and you're naked and you're shamed, God's trying to reveal to you you still got a lot of shame on your life. The work's not done. God still needs to work some. We need to have dreams where we're naked and unashamed. Not not proud of what we're wearing, but I'm just telling you, at a place where you don't you don't have a thing where you worry about what people think of you. Hallelujah. Don't we? We wear clothes, we wear things to cover up our inadequacies. Black makes you look thin. Hallelujah. You know, y'all can laugh. Y'all are like, oh, my God, he's talking about me. <laughs> we're, we're all there. We all struggle with that because we don't have enough self-worth. We're worried about how others think about us, so we want to look good on the outside. And you need to. I'm not against that. Here, please, please don't come to church in another way. I'm just saying it's this whole thing that we got to understand who he is in us. And she went through that process And it said, the young lady, verse 13, would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given to her to take place from the uh, the harem to the king's palace. So now, after this preparation, she can go to the king and ask whatever she wants. Hallelujah. That sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? But here's what happened. She had a teacher, an apostolic guy in the harem, the church. I don't know how you say the name, H-E-G-A-I. And in verse 15, it says, in the middle of the verse, it says, she did not request anything except what this Higai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. See, here's the thing. When you sit under apostolic training and equipping, you realize your desires of your heart change, and they're no longer about you, but they're about what the king would want. So we fulfill the Scripture in in Psalms where it says, uh, delight thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of his heart. That's probably the most abused Scriptures in the Bible. We think we can just take our desires to God and just we delight in you, Lord, we love you. Now here's the desires of my heart. And we throw out fleshly desires. Because see here, when you've been trained under the power of the Father, what happens is his desires become yours. So when you come to the king, you don't ask on your behalf, you ask on what he would want you to ask. Are you with me? So we see this whole passage, verse 17, and it says the king loved Esther more than all the women. 
And she found favor and kindness with him more than all the other virgins, so that they set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, here's the thing. It's not that the king didn't like the other virgins. It's that he saw something different on her. That's what an overcoming anointing is. It's not that God wants to favor anybody else over somebody else, but it's somebody who's willing to pay the price to go through the process to be prepared. Then he looks at you and he says, I find favor on you because you now have my heart. And if you have my heart, I can entrust to you everything of the kingdom. Because if you don't have his heart, you're going to use it to get your own gain. Somebody say, ow. All right, just come with me here, all right? Just follow with me here. I know it's a hard word, but um, it's in his Bible, so please talk to the Lord about that. All right, can you go down to verse 22. We see the whole thing. The story goes on. But the plot became, there's a plot to, to destroy um, the king. And it says, but the plot became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther. And Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now, when the plot was investigated, it was found out to be so, and that they were both hanged on the gallows, that it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. Now, here's what I want you to get. Everything about your life is written in a book, Psalms 139. You were ordained of the Lord. We've been preaching on this on Wednesdays. You've been ordained of the Lord for great things in the kingdom. It's been chronicled. Now, I want you to get that. Every good deed that you do for the kingdom has been marked by the Lord. He keeps good records. So there is a time when we're going to ask the Lord to read the chronicles. I remember when I was believing for finances I, 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 uh, for a trip to Israel. I ter- shared the story before. I reminded the Lord of, of, of this thing. Lord, I've sowed my first fruits. I've sowed, Lord. And I said, Lord, I ask you for provision now. And so what I did is I went to the chronicles of heaven and I told the Lord what was written about me because I knew I'd been faithful in something he told me to do. And so when the Lord read the chronicles, he saw my status and he saw I had been faithful. And so provision came because it was written. But if you're not writing chronicles with your life, what's God going to read? So we write chronicles with our faithfulness to him. I know that hit really hard right there, but hang in there. You know, every good boxer takes a hit and comes right back. So just come right back, all right? Chapter 3, and the king Xerxes promoted Haman. Everybody say boo. Boo. Yeah, when you go to a Jewish service, they do this whole thing where they boo Haman, and it's fun. It's, it's a great thing to go to. And he said, and he advanced him, and he established his authority over all the princes of, uh, who were with him. Now, these are ungodly leaders that the Lord puts in place. Do you all know a few? I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> but there are those that God appoints. Why? Because he wants to see if the bride will rise up and remove them from their office. Because he wants to see if the church will actually be the ecclesia and begin to govern the kingdom of God. And so they will fulfill what Revelation says, that the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. I'm sorry. I love our government. It's there for our protection. It's there for our safety. But God's government rules. It's not ruling right now in the natural because the church, the bride, has not gone through the process like Esther to begin to rise up, but we're in the place. How many of y'all's flesh is being rubbed right now? This sermon's doing a little bit. I got one of those lavas. What do you call it? Loofahs, yeah. That's loofah. That sounds Polish or something. But anyway, I'm, I'm loofahing you this morning, all right? I just made up a word. Put that in your dictionary. All right. But then, so he put this Haman in there, and Haman was an evil man. And Mordecai, the Holy Spirit, says, I will not bow to a false government. That's when Peter said to the Sanhedrin, you told him not to talk about Christ. He said, I will not do that. I will speak of his name. So when our government up in the northeast in five states made a ruling recently and said, you cannot pray in the name of Jesus it's time that we pray in the name of Jesus. I was asked to do that at, a, pub, at a, uh, a political party, and I accidentally slipped and said, in the name of Jesus. Oh, you're watching. I'm sorry. The one, 
the one that invited me to the meeting. Ah, thank you. All right, there we go. I won't say her name. I won't call your name out, all right? There we go. You just busted me. That's good. All right. So here we go. Keep reading so we can get past this moment. Verse 5. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down or paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. And so the next verse said he, just, he just thought he would destroy the Jewish people from that moment on. In verse 8, chapter 3, are you all following me? And he says, And there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different than those of all our people, and they do not observe the king's laws, so it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. See, the spirit of the enemy does not want you to remain when you don't bow to the system of the world. We obey the laws of this land as as long as they're in the biblical worldview of what God says we're supposed to function in. But when they tell us we can't pray, when they tell us we can't honor the Lord in our daily life, when we can't do certain things, it's time for us to stand up. The Holy Spirit doesn't bow to Haman's, so we should not either. I honor where honors do, but I don't honor what is against his word. Are you all with me? And so we see this, that that, that there was an edict put out, verse 13, uh, that Haman put out an edict. He said, letters were sent out by couriers to all the king's providences to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to seize their positions, uh, possessions as plunder. And that's Purim. That started last night at sundown. So we are on this day today. This is where we are right here. So we have arrived at a moment where there's an edict against all of us. That The enemy has put an edict out in the spirit that he wants you dead. That's what this thing's all about. You, you understand that if we were, I, I don't have time, but if we were to go back to Genesis and we would study what the, the seed of the enemy is against the seed of us, it's because in you is the seed to produce a deliverer. And the enemy is trying to kill every seed that could become a deliverer. That's why abortion is a spirit. That's why abortion doesn't want babies born because within a seed of somebody is something that's going to defeat his kingdom. That's why he's using perversion, sexual perversion, to get people not to have babies. There's a movement. I had a dream recently that there was a whole worldwide movement to reduce population. And I saw, I went into the secret meeting and I saw them, all these leaders of the world, and then I woke up the next day and I saw the headlines and they said there was a meeting to come to talk about population growth in the world. I knew the Lord let me go in there ahead of time to see their agenda. And their agenda is not to make our earth safe. Their agenda is to create another race that's not the race of the king. That's why we got to multiply and have a bunch of babies. You ladies, men, you get busy. Let's come on. Let's fill this house with, with, with. Hey, we had a baby in our 40s, so don't give me none of that. I'm too old, all right? Abraham and Sarah standing right here. So we see this. So today is Purim, chapter 4, verse 4. And Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the queen writhed in her great anguish. So she felt, she heard this story of what was about to happen. Verse 8, the last part of verse 8, and it said, Esther uh, informed her in order to go uh, to the king to implore his favor and plead with him for, for her people. Now, Esther wasn't willing to do this at this time. Verse 11, and all the king's servants and the peoples of the king's providences know for any man and woman who comes to the king in the inner court who is not summoned, he was but one law that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him him golden scepter so that he may live. And all I have not been all and and I have not been summoned to come to the king for these thirty days. Now, so she had a, a law that said she couldn't come to the king and ask for anything for thirty days. And so she was being a good citizen, <laughs> it seemed so that she didn't have to go to the king. And sometimes you say, well, i got to obey the laws of the land and not talk about Jesus. Because why? It's convenient to you. Because when you speak for him, it's costly. 
And so Esther was challenged with this, this message here. Was she going to be willing to do this? And it goes on. It says in the related to Esther's words to Mordecai, she told him. Then Mordecai told him to reply to Esther. Now, this is the Holy Spirit speaking to us today. Do not imagine that you are in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. So you may preserve yourself for one day, but you will not preserve yourself for the days to come. That's what America's done with our economy. We have preserved today, and we're going to pay a price later. It's a picture of it. And so we're seeing that in the natural. We had to make a choice here. And so he writes this letter to her, and so the Holy Spirit writes a scroll to our hearts today and says, you can't escape this thing. You have a call on your life, and you can't run from it anymore. And I'm commissioning you right now in the Spirit. You understand everybody in this room has a call on their life, and you can't run from it anymore. If you leave this room today with this word, you're held accountable. Hallelujah. I love how he's Jehovah Sneaky. That's why I thought some of you came for one reason and you're going to leave with another. Because you think that you were doing okay until you heard this word. I'm not talking about my preaching. I'm talking about this word. This right here. Are you with me? Yeah. And then the, our, my favorite verse, verse, chapter 4, verse 14. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not obtained royalty for such a time as this. Before I went to Bulgaria, not this last time, time four, I got a word. Somebody gave me this verse and said, God was going to use you for a time such as this. And I remember I went there and I just, I just, uh, I was going to speak at a, a governmental conference with lawyers and politicians and the top leaders of, the, of, of a lot of Europe. And I'm sitting there, I'm the only pastor on the agenda, <laughs> you know, especially from, from America, whatever. And I thought, oh, my God, what, what have I got myself into? I said, Lord, am I equipped for this day? I said, here I am among these dignitaries, and I'm just Tim from Shreveport. That's what I was thinking in my mind. And so I had my notes, and I went up there on my iPad. And it was still on American time. It didn't shift it, and I pushed my thing on, and it was 414. And I knew, I said, okay, I started crying before I could speak because I, now I knew that God had appointed me for that day. And I was a nobody, but I, I went through enough process that God made me a somebody in the spirit that day. And so I had a voice to speak, so much so that when we released what we released, they asked me to come back and be the main speaker for the pastors the next year. I'm not, please don't, I'm not, I don't want to build myself up. I just want you to understand that you can do the same thing. God has called me to stand with Israel and the Jewish people. One of my few encounters where I was taken to heaven in this encounter, I was taken to this room that was so beautiful, all white, no shadows, no turning, just like the Scripture says. And I was in this room, and, and the Lord had had a, it was just an empty room with a chair like this in a, a white box with a red bow on it. And, he's, and just basically I knew the gift was for me, and I opened up the box, and on top was a, a piece of matzah bread. And I took out the matzah bread, and, I, and the Lord said, break it because I'm going to use you to break bread for the Jewish people. So I received a commission in heaven for my destiny on earth. And you have a commission as well in heaven where God has commissioned you for certain different things. And this is one of mine. I'm not saying everybody has that, but that was my commission. And so God has given me favor in Israel. Give me favor with Jewish people. Give me favor with rabbis. It's just one of those things because, God, I was faithful to go after it, and so therefore God uses me that way, and he'll use you that way. Whatever you've been faithful in, he'll use you in. And so we, we do that next week. Uh, not this week, but the following week, uh, Susan and I and some of the people here in the congregation, we're going to Israel, and we're going to D.C., and we're going to be in the senator's offices and the congressman's offices, and we're going to be standing there as an advocate for Israel because, see, that's our mandate, and that's the mandate of this house is to stand with Israel. And so God's opened the doors for that to happen, and so we're, we're going to be used that way, and I want you to be used that way too. Whatever God has for you, I, I, don't want, I, I don't want to spend time on myself. I just want you to, to get a picture of that. Are you with me? Verse 16, last part, he says, And thus you will go to the king, 
uh, he, he tells him, and you will, you will not do according to the law. And if you, she says, if I perish, I perish. We got to get that attitude. I'm going to do what God says to do. If I die, I die. My mentality is this. If I'm going under, I'm going under with God. I don't want to go to prison. I don't like jail. I've visited many people there. I don't like it. But who knows what God's got in store? And I pray that I've done enough death to flesh that if that were to ever happen one day, I'd have what it takes to stand there. But there's going to be a time that I can choose to not say something and keep out of jail and say something the Holy Spirit says, and I have to go to jail. Or you have to go to jail. I hope I go, you're there with me. All right, I need some friends there. All right? Verse 3. He said, then, he, then the king said to her, what is troubling you, Queen Esther? And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom I shall give it to you. See, she went in and she broke man's laws, but she went in with the Holy Spirit, so therefore there was favor with God. And so she went in properly and he gave half the king. That's dominion of the earth. The Lord says, I'm in charge of heaven. You guys are full of earth. You're in charge of earth, so that's our kingdom. We're to have dominion and reign over you. Are you all with me? All right. I'm almost done. Verse 7, so Esther replied, my petition, my quest is, request is, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and do what I request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I have prepared for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. And we know the story here. It goes on that Haman comes in there, and, and he gets busted for what he's been doing. And what I love about this story is... is um, is verse 1 of chapter 6. It says here, During the night the king could not sleep, so he had to uh, order to bring the book of the records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. That means that what has been written about you gets read before the king. And then of that, it reminds the king. That's why we read Scripture uh, to the Lord. That's why we prophesy to the Lord what's written about us because we want to make sure that we're in agreement with him. He doesn't need to hear it, really, but he needs to hear us say it. And as we say the chronicles over our life, what happens is there's agreement because if any two agree touching one thing, they have what they ask. So if heaven agrees with your prophetic, then guess what? You have what you ask. See, this queen was the one that Jesus was talking about who said, if you ask anything in my name, you can have it. It's the one he said that if you speak to that mountain, it shall be removed. This is who he's talking to. Somebody who's willing to be an overcomer. Are y'all still here? All right. Now, I want to close with this because it goes on, the story goes on, and Haman became terrified. And uh, so in verse, chapter 7, verse 10, the whole thing comes unraveled, and, and Haman gets hanged. Verse 10 of chapter 7 says, So they hanged Haman on the gallows which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. The only way God's anger is going to subside is when the evil ones hang. As long as evil is ruling the earth, God's anger is still available. So do we want to see God's anger subside? Amen. How do we do it? Let the enemy hang. Well, that's a better word than you caught there. That's really powerful because that means you don't have to hang. All right? And so we see this in, in chapter 9. We, we see the, the whole thing there about the, the same day. Pur, Purim is the first verse there. There are ten sons of Haman. And in this battle, these ten sons are, are killed along with thousands of other 500 there on this story, but uh, up to 75,000 die. But they were, they were killed, and then the day came where they hung them after they were already dead. Now, this seems like to be an odd request by, Haman, by uh, Esther to hang dead people, but she wanted to do it. She, 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 she did that. And the rabbi's writings about this, they have several thoughts. But it says, after they did this in chapter 9, it said, that tomorrow we will hang them. Let tomorrow uh, be granted us. And they hang the ten sons of Haman. Now, the word tomorrow there in the rabbi's teaching means this. There is a tomorrow, there is a now, and there is a tomorrow which is to come, which means the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he did yesterday, he'll do today, and what he do today, he'll do again. So when you got a Haman in your life, 
The Lord said, I hung him yesterday, I'll hang him today, and I'll hang him in the future. If he has sons that are coming against you, I hung them yesterday, I'll hang them today, and I'll hang them again. Because God's thorough through that way. And so that's what that means. The rabbis uh, came up with that. And, and so in other words, she was prophesying. What Esther was doing, she was prophesying to Haman's ten sons that this would not be a single episode of history, but it would repeat, be repeated in another day, in a tomorrow day. It should be noted that Adolf Hitler banned the observance of Purim during his rulership. He declared it a capital offense to own a copy of the book of Esther. In a speech made in November 10, 1938, after the day of Kristallnacht, a prominent Nazi named Julius Stryker said that the, as the Jews butchered 75,000 Persians in one night, the same fate would have befallen the Germans. The German people had the Jews succeeded in inciting a war against Germany. The Jews would have been instituted a new Purim festival in Germany. They were scared of the Jews because they thought they could rise up and do this story again. The, the, the Nazis believed the Bible. They believed that word that it would happen yesterday, it would happen today, and it would happen in the future, so they wanted to annihilate the people that could most threaten them. And so we as a church are the greatest threat to a, a non-godly government. Now, the, the rabbis do some, uh, you, you read the book Bible Code and things like that, but they do some patterns in Scripture. And when they did the ten, stun, ten sons, they found a pattern. And what they found, there was a nu- numerical value in the Hebrew and the, the Toph Shin Zion. The, they saw that, and it, it numbered 577, 5707, which is 1946. In our date, because 5707 is the Hebrew calendar. And, and that was a very important day because in 1946, there were 11 Nazis that were going to be hanged for their war crimes against the Jews. And right before, one of them, right before that, one of them took Sinai and died. So 10 of them were hanged in one day for the crimes against Israel. So when Esther was prophesying, it will happen again, it happened again. Ha. Huh. So if it happened once, it'll happen again. So there's a prophetic clue here. Let me give you a little history here. In the Gulf War, George Bush Sr. started that war, and Saddam Hussein sent missiles into Israel. When the 39th missile hit southwest Israel near Tel Aviv, one of the rabbis stood up and he says, now the war is going to be over. When they asked him why he said it, he said because 39 is a number of chastisement. He knew that Israel was being chastised for its rebellion against God. And so he knew that the scuds that were coming from Saddam were not just the enemy of Israel. It was for the sin of Israel. And so when he said that 39th hit, he said, we've been chastised. That's it. We're going to win the war. Because the, pro- the proph- process is this, is once you go through the chastisement and you repent, you end that war. Hallelujah. So we see that the the war lasted 40 days. Get this. The war ended on Purim. So the victory was won that day. And so that's the day Esther did that. George Bush Jr., when he went to Iraq, he started the war on Purim. 21 days after Purim, we were in Baghdad. And they put a noose around Saddam Hussein's statue, and we pulled him down. So another Haman fell. Because why? He shot missiles against the Jewish people. Hello? So Esther is a story about that. See, Daniel in Daniel uh, 10, 13, said Daniel was hindered by the prince of Persia for 21 days. And then he got the victory. 21 days speaks of a victory over Haman. In 1946, these Ten Nazis that were hung. It was called the day of the final verdict. And if we examine that day, it fell on a Jewish festival called Hoshana Rabbah, which is the 21th of Tishri, 21. It's a traditional day in the Jewish belief. On that day, 21 Tishri, is the day that God, it's a day that God's verdicts are sealed. So God was even doing it then. Now we got another prince of Persia in the earth, it's called Iran. 
Iran is Persia. It's moving toward Iraq, Lebanon to reestablish a Babylonian empire. And God is looking for King Esther's to rise up. Hallelujah. And so the bride of Christ is called that. We're going to join God in this battle. Now, the story went on, and they won the battle. They had the festival of Purim, three-day festival, just partying. Hallelujah. How many of y'all into a party? Jesus was in the grave for three days, and he rose, and now we have a party. When he rose, the dead in Christ, as many of those, the saints of old rose. That's why they wanted to be buried in Jerusalem. Because they saw the God of yesterday would be the God of the future. And they said, Lord, we want to be there when this happens. And so all these people gathered all around Jerusalem, came out of their graves and started testifying of God. Can you imagine that? Abraham come knocking on your door. I'm here to tell you he was the Christ. I waited 2,000 years. I'm here. How you doing? And I believe theologically, and you may not agree with me, when Jesus ascended, he said he sent it in a cloud. I think they went with him. I think the cloud spoke of the cloud of witnesses. And they just went up with him. I don't see him around recently, so. Although they could be, right? So there we are. There's the story. Now you are being commissioned to be an Esther today. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, you're going to be held accountable for this word. I am too. I know that the Lord just said, this day's special. I'm going to commission people. So let's do this. Let's stand. Have the worship team come, if they would. Oh, I'm sorry. Where, where do I have? Hey, come on up. I didn't know. That's good to know. Let's bow your heads for a second. Holy Spirit, in this room are many Esthers. In this room are many Esthers. Now, let's just let the Holy Spirit move for a second. I know I preach longer than normal. Some of y'all are tired. And, Lord, I just pray your fire. There's just fires coming in the room right now. I just feel his fire coming in the room right now. Holy Spirit, begin to burn in us what it takes to be like you. Let us go through the process of refinement that we can become like Esther. Just one night with the king. And we can save a whole nation. Some of you are just one night away from being commissioned to do a great thing. As you go through your life and you deal with your issues and you're faithful to work on that stuff, God's going to invite you into his presence. He's going to take his scepter. He's going to put it on your head and he's going to say, you're commissioned for a new destiny. Now, Esther was already commissioned before she got the scepter, but she got commissioned in another way that day, and authority came to her. Because we can all walk in power. Everybody can believe in the name of Jesus, and people can be healed. Demons can leave. But authority comes from Him. And authority is so much different because authority means the enemy recognizes you. When you walk in power, you're making the enemy recognize the Lord. I remember A.A. Allen, a great healing ministry, cast out demons one time, and uh, Brother Shambach asked him, what would you say to that person? And A.A. Allen said, I said to them, I'm A.A. Allen. And the demons knew that he was a child of the king. What would demons say if you say, I'm Joe Young, whatever? We want the devil to know that we have the king in us. And so, Lord, I just release authority across this room. There's a scepter here. I don't know how to explain it. It's here. 
I saw it floating over the room. And many of you are about to have one night with the king. And the Lord's going to come and just visit you. Just like when he took me to heaven and gave me that encounter. You're going to have one of those encounters. I'm telling you, he's no respecter. He did it for me. He can do it for you. You may not have to go to heaven, but it's nice. If you want that, just receive that right now. Just receive that right now. God, there's such a spirit of prophecy here. Let's just worship in here for a second. Can y'all give about five minutes to just worship? Just worship him. I worship you. you need the Lord here today, this is the day to give your life to Him. Just surrender your life to Him right now. seen a way to administrate this, so I'm going to ask my elders to come and their wives and John and John Leslie, if you'll come. We're going to create a tunnel here. We're going to let you walk through this tunnel, and we're just going to lay hands on you, and we're going to commission you. It's the only way I know how to touch everybody. You're going to have to move quickly through this line. Don't worry about a prophetic word. We may get some afterwards. I have to tell my leaders that because we're very prophetic, so you will put another line there. So you guys come on down here. And yeah, that's good right there. That's good. And there's a, there's a sword. I'm going to just ask the Lord to bring the sword right here in the middle of this tunnel. And there'll be eight of us, and this is a new beginning. The Lord gave us eight. It was a big number last weekend in Oklahoma. And we're going to just commission you now for this season. Now get ready because your life's about to change if you go through this tunnel. Because you're going to go inside one way and you're going to come out another on the other side. Because I saw scrolls in the room and I saw commissions in the room. And I saw angelic beings come and just begin to deliver purposes and destinies here today. Now you're going to have dreams and you're going to have visions about them. God's going to speak them directly to you. I'm going to ask the communion table to be open so as you come through the tunnel, you can go take communion afterwards and seal the deal. Seal what God put in you.